He gave them all these things because he wanted his people to be the best. And based on that, who wouldn't want to know them to reduce the amount of their um, mortality? And then who would not want to know their God who told them how to live longer? Do you see the formula? And isn't it interesting that he's called us in similar fashion, right? Well, I call it 10 steps ahead, the evidence. The evidence. Now, I like to talk about health, but it is a fact that most people, when they think about health, they think about diet. Is that true? He's going to talk about diet. Well, yes, I'll do that. But I want to sort of go down the path and looking at this from a more holistic perspective and see if we can go a little deeper. What else comprises our health? Oh, this is Sabbath school, by the way. What you view, what you study, right? All those things can contribute to whether you have good health, yeah? Here's an interesting one. What about praising God? Is that healthy? Is that good for your health? Oh, this is Sabbath school, by the way. I bet you all don't know how I did that, do you? Huh? Huh? You're ready to listen now, aren't you? I don't know what that was, but it was kind of cool. Psalm 107. The Bible says in Psalm 107, let us pray together as we get started. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this time together, for Sabbath school, and we pray now that you would take hold of us. Fill us, Lord. Speak to us and share us wonderful things out of your law. Lord, we cannot do anything here lest you do the work. And Father, we ask now that you would give us your spirit. We claim the promise together that we being evil know how to give good gifts to our children. How much more shall our Heavenly Father give the gift of the Holy Spirit to them that ask? And we are asking in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In Psalm 107, turn with me there in your Sabbath school book, the Bible. Psalm 107. And what we're going to do is when we get to a page, because we're going to use the Bible as best we can. When you get there, say amen. Amen. And you will notice in verse 8. Can someone read that nice and loud? Verse 8. Psalm 107 and verse 8. He led them forth by the night right way, is that? and they might go to a city set in It was a beautiful verse, though, brother, and you read it well. Okay, but that wasn't the one. Psalm 107, verse 8. Oh, I read the wrong one. Okay. That's all right. It was a beautiful verse. Okay. Oh, that men would put trust in the Lord. Wow. See, that was read so well that it came with theme music. Did you notice that? It comes with theme music. Can someone read verse 15? Verse 15, same Division of the Psalms, but verse 15. Ah, that was from the, what version of the Bible do you have? NIV. Very good. Someone, can someone read for us in that same division of the Psalms, 21, verse 21. Now, is God repeating himself? Verse 31, he says something very similar, if not exact. He said, oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. God wants us to praise him. He wants us to give him glory. And I love talking about the first, the second, and the third angel's messages. Those are very distinct and unique to this church. Is that true? Right? And in the first angel's message, it says, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. Fear God, does that mean be afraid of him? What does it mean? 
Be in awe. Revere him. Stand and see the awesomeness of your God. Is he awesome to you? It's awesome, isn't he? And he wants us to recognize that awesomeness about him and give him praise. Did you know that by giving glory to God, by praising him, you actually are fulfilling the first angel's message? Did you know that? Ah, it's always good to back that up with a text, isn't it? Turn in your Bibles to Psalm 50. Psalm, the 50th division of the Psalms, and verse 23 is what we're looking for. And when you are there, say amen. Can someone read that for us? So whoever offers me praise gives me glory. So give glory to God for the hour his judgment has come. So a part of, a part of the first angel's message is giving God praise. How does that look, friends? Now, I travel a lot. I'm privileged. God has blessed me. God books me here and he books me there, here in this country and in the world. And here's something that I've noticed. Are you ready for it? I have found out. I'm not talking about this church now, so don't let anybody get upset. I'm not talking about this church. But I've seen smiling faces. I've had warm handshakes. In fact, when I walked through the door, the person greeted me and gave me a big old hug. I said, I'm in the right place. But I have gone places. And there are people who come to church who are not happy. Now, sometimes, let's be fair, sometimes there's reasons. There are things that's going on in people's lives, right, that would cause you to enter into these courts with a low countenance. With sadness. Some people are mourning. Some people are grieving. But when God says, enter my courts with thanksgiving, is it possible that even that is a remedy? He knows we're going to, in this sinful world, he knows we're going to go through challenges. He knows we're going to have issues. He knows that we're going to grieve about things. But he is always there. He thinks of everything. Enter in with thanks in your heart. So as we look at, as we look at these principles of health, you notice that I have there, invest time in others. You see the other one that is, that is not your typical? What time does Sabbath school end, by the way? 1120? Next service starts, though. I, I want to make sure that we're... So the next service starts at 1130. Uh -huh. Okay, all right. We got to move. We got to move. So if I ask you a question, you got you to gotta, you gotta jump right in. There's no, oh, uh, let me think about it. I got it. Educate yourself. Educate yourself. That is a principle that you're not really familiar with, isn't it? Now, just to, just to satisfy our curiosity about invest time in others, that's in the Bible. God invested time in us. And we find the science, here's the science, the science says that modern science confirms that tangible assistance to others protects our health and lengthens our lives. Now you know why God has called you to church. Because, yes, it is a blessing to you, but by coming here and learning how to do for others, to bless others, he knows it's good for your health. Huh? That's what the science says. The science says, in this research, those who had helped others in some way the previous year had lower mortality rates than those who did not. In other words, when you do something for other people, something takes place in your hormones. There are things that are released inside your body that actually strengthen your immune system. You all don't look convinced, not one bit. <laughs> Okay, I got to prove it to him. Can we do a social experiment, Mark? Okay, I want everyone to take out. I'm going to show you how this works, right? I want you to take out $20, $50, $100 bill. Just hold it up. I'm going to come by and I'm going to take it. 
and I want you to see how good you feel. Huh? Oh, bless your heart, brother. He's ready to do it. He's ready to feel good. I don't take cards, brother. I need to... I need to... <laughs> you may keep your money, but the Bible tells us it is better to give than it is to receive. Those were not just words. God was giving a prescription. Amen. Now, here was something, so that's invest time in others. But then there's educate yourself. I have to move through this very quickly for the sake of time. Now, there were ten lepers. How many lepers were there? I don't know how Jesus does this, but by divine providence, he has the right number of people in the right place at the right time. And to have this object lesson, this wonderful picture of this experience, Jesus had ten lepers on the roadway as he was walking. And he, they were lepers, right? There, was there a cure for leprosy back then? Of course there wasn't. And Jesus healed how many of them? He healed all ten of them. Go to Luke chapter 17, and let's look at the story as it unfolded there. Luke chapter 17. Luke 17, are you there, amen? He healed all ten lepers, and he tells them in verse 14, Go show yourselves unto the priests. Because see, the priests were not only priests, but they were also the, the ones who were the physicians of the day. They would determine when someone was clean. So he was sending them to be cleansed by them. So he said, go show yourselves unto the priest. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, how many of them? One of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back. Turned back and went, or with a loud voice. What kind of a voice? Do you think that's a coincidence? The loud cry. He goes back and he does what? I like what the King James says. What does the King James say? He glorified him. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. I'm telling you that God has called this church in the last days, no matter what's going on with us, it is evidence to the rest of the world that we are his people because nothing, nothing, nothing the Bible tells us we are cast down, but we're not destroyed. Amen. Right? Persecuted, but we're not. And he goes through this whole litany of things. Yes, we've got these things in our lives, but we still give glory to God. We Amen. praise him. Hallelujah. 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 So this was evidence all the way around. It was evidence. Watch this. There's so much goodness in the story of the lepers. It was evidence to Jesus that he was appreciated. Do you think Jesus looks for that? Do you look for that with your children? When you do something good for them, do you expect them to come back and say, thank you, Mama, thank you, Dad, thank you, Grandpa. We really appreciate you. Makes you feel good, doesn't it? You don't need it. You did it because you love them. But, oh, boy, it sure feels good. Oh, it's a terrible thing. I've got two boys. They're teenagers. Pray for me. And I give them gifts. And they just go, yes! And then they go get on their phones. <laughs> and I wait, and I wait. And eventually they say thank you. But God has that same experience. He's a person. He expects and wants and desires our love. So it was evidence to Jesus that that man appreciated him. And he wanted that. He wouldn't have brought it up if he didn't. He said, you've come back, but where are the other nine? Why didn't they come back? Why didn't they come back and say thank you? Where are they? Don't they appreciate what I did for them, like you? He wanted it. In addition to that, it was evidence. That's why we call this 10 Steps Ahead, the evidence. God has always been way ahead of the science, right? Anybody who can just say you're healed of leprosy and they walk off, oh boy, and they heal before they even get to the synagogue. He's got some pretty serious science. We haven't been able to match that yet, have we? But he was also attempting to give evidence to those at the synagogue. What evidence was he trying to give them? That he was the Messiah, a Bible prophecy. That's what he wanted them to see. 
Now, real quick, to make plain natural law. I love this. this is one of my favorite quotations from the Spirit of Prophecy. Testimonies, Testimonies, Volume 3, page 161, to make plain natural law. See, we have not given the full due that the health message has because we see here that it is to make plain natural law and urge the obedience of it, for it is the work that accompanies the third angel's message to prepare a people for the coming of the Lord. So what we see then, you cannot give a health message without giving the third angel's message. Why? Because what is the third angel's message? She says, is the third angel's message righteousness by faith or justification by faith? And in a question, it is answered in the book Righteousness by Faith by Daniels. Page 25, it says, it is the third angel's message. In verity, it is. But we don't fully understand what the third angel's message is. The third angel's message is simply this. Is there a revelation of God's character because the third angel's message whether we like it or not is simply going to show the difference between the beast power and God's love that's it do we have God's love does our lives show evidence that God's love is working in our lives he's looking for that evidence and the first place we can start is simply coming to church with a smile Saying, good morning, brother. Happy Sabbath. Good to see you. Amen. I go some places, people say, could you pray for us? What's the problem? Well, we're not speaking. I'm like, what? Yeah, I sit over here. You sit over there. Oh, wow. Did you guys, um, some kind of uh, family dispute? Yes, that is my sister. I'm, I see it all. Family members in the same church, not talking to each other. And yet those same people say, I, you know, I just, I'll be happy that, you know, maybe we'll speak to each other in heaven. Maybe all the, the we'll reconcile there. What do you all think about that? If you don't reconcile here, there you won't be in heaven. If I said something that's unkind. Because God is looking for people that look like him. That's the evidence he's looking for. So the natural law. The drinking water is a natural law. Eating a certain food is a natural law. Getting sunshine, that's a natural law. Those are all natural laws. And he's saying, these things, these are the way. This is what will help us to actually reveal what God is like. More about that as we go through the day. Another one of my favorite quotations, just in, in, in yellow, it says that we are to adopt principles that will restore in us the divine image. Restore in us. So God is trying to restore in us himself. We lost it. The character of God was well nigh obliterated. And God wants us to once again be little Jesuses who think like him, who talk like him, who love like him. Right? I have to keep moving. Now, I would, I would show this video, but I just showed the evidence of the fact that even the world now is, is starting to talk about the health principles that we hold so dear. Here was Dr. Oz, and I like to have videos in my presentations because I like to give the Bible, I like to give spirit of prophecy, good science, yeah. But I also share the 6 o'clock news with Dr. Oz because sometimes people don't accept the Bible, sometimes they don't accept spirit of prophecy for sure. Sometimes they even reject, reject good science. But for whatever reason, if Dr. Oz said it, it must be true. <laughs> so I have Dr. Oz also in my presentations. He is talking about the importance of vitamin D and the best sources from the sun. For a lot of people, they don't recognize it. Uh, thank you for the, 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 the audio there. I'll save that to the end. And ooh, we must hasten along. So here's the thing. What you have are eight laws of health, but when you look at the two that you're not so familiar with, you see that they, ap they represent this principle here. The principle is, if you invest time in others, that's love for man, right? And when you actually educate yourself, That's how you love God. See, it's not natural to you. It's not natural to us. It's not. Look at the world. They'll fight you. They'll argue with you. God who? It's not normal. You're blessed. We're blessed to be in this place right now, today. Because that means that God got through. He got through to us. Yeah? Praise the Lord for that. 
But in the Savior's life, this was perfectly exemplified. Love for man and love for God. That's what Jesus said. Supreme love for God and love for your neighbor, loving him as yourself. Yeah? In fact, it was asked, what are the two great commandments? He says, first, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. And the second is love thy neighbor as thyself. And you find that. So here's the thing. Yes, the, those eight principles of health, they're good. And it shows that God has actually blessed us as a church and will bless you physically. But the other two principles, what they do is they give the evidence that he's blessing you. Let me, let me continue to show you what I mean. Take, for example, Genesis 2.15. Genesis 2.15, that's your exercise principle that's found in the Bible. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden and to tend it and to keep it. To, to tend it and keep it. Seems like the exact same thing, but that word keep is shamar, which means to observe in the same way that we observe the Sabbath. We keep the Sabbath, which means we're actually looking at something. To observe is something that has to do with your optics. You're seeing something. You're observing something. So old school Adventists used to say, I cannot do that that day because I observe the Sabbath. Hopefully when they said that, they didn't mean that they go home and rest and sleep, right? Observing, because see, the Sabbath is simply a memorial of creation. And what God invites us to do is to see him in creation where we slow down on this day and we take notice. That he is our God. He's our creator. He's our redeemer. Right? So you can imagine Adam and Eve. Here's um, in the spirit of prophecy. She's quoting that text. She says, oh, go back. To the dwellers in Eden was committed the care of the garden. To dress it and keep it. See, she quotes it. Their occupation was not wearisome, but pleasant and invigorating. God appointed labor as a blessing. So this was exercise for Adam. Adam was perfect when he came from the hand of God. However, God said, Adam, you're perfectly symmetrical, but you still must exercise. Isn't that something? Did God trust Adam? Oh, yes, he did. He trusted him enough to allow him to, to name the animals. That's some serious trust, isn't it? Adam, I'm going to let you... Help me name the animals. But yet, when it came to things like exercise and his diet, he did not leave it up to Adam. He didn't. Adam, this is your food. Adam, you got to exercise. So in the garden, he would exercise in the garden by just kind of tending in the, the garden. But the keeping part was different. The keeping part, notice this, it says, skipping down to the highlighted area, they held converse with leaf and flowers. That's Adam and Eve. They held converse with leaf and flower and tree, gathering from each the secrets of its life. Wow, it's right. That means Adam could go up to a rose and say, Woo, what makes you so pretty? And that rose would be like, well, you know, right? Conversation. Now, that's supernatural, yes, because guess what? There's a man by the name of George Washington Carver. Anybody ever hear of him? I tell you, he made so many things from the plant and from peanuts and all these different things, right? Even the soy products that we love. He made those things, but someone asked him, what is it that you have that caused you to know so much about plants? How do you know all these things? He was a deeply spiritual man, and he answered and said, I ask them and they tell me. It's a documentary and a book called The Man Who Spoke the Flowers, right? So, turns out that Dr. Mon Dr. Monica and I'm uh, Gagliano from the University of Western Australia, I thought this was interesting, has been monitoring roots with highly sensitive apparatus and believer, believes that they crackle at a frequency of 220 hertz, which the human ear hears as a low A note. Plants actually are communicating. I wish I can go into it more, but I'm just giving you the signs that it wasn't crazy or you're crazy if you're talking to your plants, right? Sometimes people think people are crazy when they're like, oh, you're doing well today. No, no, no. They're probably talking back. You just can't hear them. On every leaf of the forest, God's name was written. See, God has placed his character, his law. His name is in everything. That's why at the end of time, He's looking for people who respond to him in the same way that plants do. Bible for that? 
and I, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him a hundred and forty and four thousand, having his father's name written where? In their foreheads. In their minds. See, he's already got it in the trees. He's got it in the flowers. Now he's trying to get it in us. Amen? So, as they were talked to these flowers, God's name was written. The order and harmony of creation spoke to them of infinite wisdom and power. They were ever discovering some attraction that filled their hearts with deeper love and called forth fresh expressions of what? Gratitude. Notice how we just came right back around to being thankful. You see that? So God put Adam and Eve in the garden to educate them about himself. And they would learn about him through talking to his creation, by experiencing his creation. Amen. Praise the Lord. See, as, and I thought about this, I thought about this a, a lot. I said, boy, Adam and Eve were in that garden, and just every day, Sunday, take Sunday, they look at some flowers, some plants or trees or shrubbery or something, and they would see God's name written, and they would say, wow. And then the next day, Monday, they would do the same thing, and they go, wow. And by the time they got to Sabbath, after having all those experiences, what could they do? What was the only thing that they wanted to do? Worship God. Oh, they, God was showing, they say, they would be pregnant with praise. Do you know that God intended that? That we would, see, we can't necessarily go out into a garden. Sometimes we live in the cities, and we don't have them. But guess where we can find them? In the garden word right in his word we can find him here and when we get this we get to church on sabbath what are we ready to do praise him show me someone who's not ready to praise god on sabbath they probably haven't been with god all week he wants he wants our affections daily like the evening the morning and the evening sacrifice coming daily we can do that that was demonstrated, as I shared last night, in the sanctuary service. So here's a superlative, nothing. Now, nothing tends more to promote health of body and soul than does a spirit of gratitude and praise. Wow, full stop right there. Is that powerful? That means you can't drink enough water. That means you can't eat a, uh, a, a great raw diet of fruits and vegetables galore. You can't exercise enough. Nothing is better than coming here and in your time with God saying, thank you, Jesus. It's good for you. Hallelujah. In fact, that very expression is the highest praise. You all don't believe me. Let me tell you something. If you just said, ha, do it. Ha. Le. What do you feel, feel that? Right in the diaphragm, don't you? Right here in the gut, where you have so much health, everything starts here. Good health starts here, bad health starts here. In the diaphragm, in the gut area. So when you're saying, hallelujah, I tell you, you can do 20 of those, you'll work up a sweat and probably lose some belly fat. I'm telling you. <laughs> it's good for you to say hallelujah. You don't believe it, I'm going to give you some science. So nothing is better than that. Nothing. Oh, we got we to gotta hasten on. It's got three minutes. Three minutes. You guys are on a tight ship here, I tell you. Got to skip. I got to skip along. So here's where I get that yeah, educate yourself. It's from the spirit of prophecy, letter 30, 322. It says, educate yourself to praise him. This is a great remedy for disease. Diseases of the soul and of the body. Oh, come on. Somebody ought to say hallelujah. hallelujah. You just got 20% healthier. Look at that. <laughs> hallelujah. Here's some signs. Adults who frequently have gratitude, who have gratitude, have more energy, more optimism, more social connections. It is good for you to say, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. In fact, it says, when, you're, when you have this attitude of gratitude, it is linked to better health, sound asleep, less anxiety. God is good. The science says that if you just say, thank you, Jesus, daily, you'll be a healthier person. Hallelujah, look at you. Now you're 40% healthier. Thank you, Jesus. Look at that. Everybody's getting healthy. Everybody's getting healthy right here this morning. Okay, so why, I'm going to close with this, why 10 and not 8? 
Okay, the Bible, the number eight is for restoration and healing. That's what it's for. That's what it means. Numbers in the Bible have, Bible have significance. There are eight laws of health. Eight people populated the earth in Genesis. In what ch chapter of Genesis? This is a happy coincidence. It was chapter eight. Eighth man from Adam lived the longest. That was Methuselah. The eighth millennium will be spent on earth restored. This is interesting, something for the scientists. Vitamin K spikes on the eighth day. Did you know that? The eighth day of life. When God said, don't circumcise a child until the eighth day, he wanted vitamin K, which is the, the, it is the vitamin that causes the blood to do what? To clot. That is the clotting vitamin that actually would prevent the child from bleeding to death. So God says, do it on the eighth day. God is awesome! <laughs> okay, here's 10. Just got to show you this real quick and close. There we go. Ten Commandments. See, the number 10 is for evidence in the Bible. It's for evidence. Every instance shows that it is evidence. So the Ten Commandments are for evidence. See, God is here to prove you. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love him, keep, your, keep his commandments. We don't keep the commandments because they save us. We keep the commandments because we are saved. That's the evidence to the world. Amen? The tithe is 10%. That's evidence that we trust God with our finances. I'm going I'm to need some sound, sound, sound men to close here. Ten righteous in Sodom would have saved it. Remember that? Got negotiated all the way down. Shadow went back 10 degrees for Hezekiah, King Hezekiah. Right? That was evidence that God was with him, heard him. Daniel asked to be proved how many days? Give me just 10 days. I'll prove it. There'll be evidence. And then after he went 10 days on a, a pulse and water diet, the Bible says he was 10 times better. The evidence was clear. 10 plagues tested Egypt. 10 generations before the flood, 10 generations after the flood. We see it's the <clears throat> most comprehensive study on longevity. Before the flood, they lived to an average of like 900 some years, right? 912 years. After the flood, it dropped down to 317 years. Oh, shouldn't that be in Jama? Right? The Bible is giving evidence that 10 generations before, great health. Then something changed. The diet changed, and then it went down precipitously. Yeah? Yeah? The disciples went and waited in Jerusalem for 10 days. They waited for the Holy Spirit to come, right? 40 days Jesus walked around. 10 days they waited. Pentecost, that's 50, right? Jesus heals 10 lepers. We saw that and we started that with it in the beginning. Now, here now here's my a tip. Clothes. If you really want to Here's my clothes. Put your seatbelts on. I want you to listen very carefully. Ready? Here we go. Now, here's a tip. If you really want a long and healthy life, it may help to live in a blue zone. That's the term given by the National Geographic fellow Dan Butner to certain parts of the world where people are most likely to live to 100 years old or more. First of all, what is a blue zone exactly? It's a demographically confirmed, geographically defined area where people are living the longest. And we found five of them. We found one in Okinawa, Japan, longest lived women on the planet. Longest lived men live up in the highlands of Sardinia. Uh, Nicoya Peninsula of Costa Rica, uh, Icaria, Greece, and then the longest live Americans right off the San Bernardino Freeway near Los Angeles, the Seventh-day Adventists, and they're living about 10 years longer wow. than their North American counterparts. <gasps> Did you hear that? No, no, don't get caught up on the smog. God works through the smog. Because no matter the smog and all the traffic, the, the science says they live how much longer? 10 years longer. There's evidence to the world that we are his people. There was a woman by the name of Mars Jatan. She lived 107 years. And there's a doctor who just stopped, just decided to retire at 90 some years. He just became 102, um, who was doing open heart surgeries until he was like, okay. Friends, God is now looking for us to step up and be that evidence to the world. Amen? Amen? Oh, by the way, this is a happy coincidence. Uh, the San Bernardino Freeway? It's the 10 Freeway. <laughs> That's a happy coincidence. Let us close with prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much that you have given us ample evidence of your great love, and you look for the evidence from us 
to show to the world that you are our God and we have a Savior, we have a Redeemer, we have one who has created us, who watches over us. And even when there's smog and even when there are other issues, you still give us something that shows the world that you've not left us alone and that you lead us and guide us. And we thank you so much for that great love that we see in Christ. And we thank you in his name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.